We've looked at catchment, the roof, and conveyance, the gutters. Now we'll go through the remaining four kinds of elements in a system, starting with filtration. And when we talk about filtration at this stage, we are thinking about the stuff that's on the roof. So think about your roof in between rainy seasons. So think about your roof uh, during the summer and the fall. Birds poop on it, sticks fall on it, little plant things start growing, microorganisms start growing. There's all kinds of stuff up there. And when the rains finally come, it's the very first rainfall that has the most of that bird poop and sticks and moss in it. That's called the first flush. And what you want to do with your system is not put that first flush water into your cistern. You want to just get rid of the, the water that falls at the beginning, that first flush. There are a couple of ways to do that. Some people use roof washers, and this was a demonstration installation at LCC. It's not there now. Um, it was in that yard that's south of Building 18. I think we're looking at Building 16 in the background here. And this box thing here is the first flush um, roof washer. So the gunk off the roof, you can see some moss up there, the gunk off the roof settles in the bottom of the tank and actually off the, off the top of the water, the clean water, uh, then after this fills up it overflows and goes down into the cistern. But most people do this first flush standpipe method. Uh, here at the bottom is a demonstration house again in Austin, Texas. And the way this works is water from the roof comes down the downspout and it goes down here and there's a cap at the bottom so this pipe doesn't go anywhere it just fills up with water the first flush off the roof comes down and fills up this pipe after enough water has fallen that pipe is full and so now anything that comes through the down pipe uh, downspout gets diverted into this second pipe, which is connected to your water system. Here on the lower right is a little bit of a close-up with that thing, and you can see there's a clean-out cap down there. So uh, the thing about this first flush pipe system is every time it rains, after it's done raining, you need to go out and take off that cap, that clean-out plug, and uh, clean out the gunk which it doesn't take long, but you just, you need to do it. Here's a really big example of some filtration. Um, this is Georgia Tech, their computing center. I think this is a 100,000 gallon cistern underground under the building. So um, they need more than little standpipey things. So they have some uh, official industrial grade filters here. That was filtration, the first flush filtration. Uh, for the rest of this uh, lecture, let's think about storage. You get the water off the roof and you store it in something until you need it. And that something is usually called a cistern, although you could call it a tank if you want to. And that cistern or tank can be located wherever you or the designer want to put it. You often see them, at least at a, a commercial scale, you often see them incorporated into the structure of the building, so you actually don't see them. Oftentimes they're underground when they're big. So here again on the left is the Georgia Tech building. There you can see that big cistern being um, installed, constructed. And then on the right is Emory University. They have an underground cistern that's about the same size. Here's MIT. Uh, I don't know if you want to take a guess who designed this Stata Center, which is part of MIT. But if you guessed Frank Geary, you'd be right, Mr. Curvy Metal. So anyway, the Stata Center at MIT 
has an underground cistern, which you see diagrammed in the bottom of the slide. Here is Portland State University. This is a, a residence hall. Uh, it's like a dormitory, but it has other stuff in the bottom, so it's a little bit mixed use. And out here in the plaza, you can see here's a sloping roof that catches the rain. Water runs off that down into some gutters. That flows into this uh, planting bed and thence down into a cistern. Here at the top of this slide is the OHSU Health Center building in the uh, South Waterfront District in Portland. They, they have just done everything you can possibly think of that one could do in a green building, including their rainwater harvesting cistern is underground, and it's a big one. Then down at the bottom of this slide is the engineering building at Oregon State, and they have an underground rainwater harvesting cistern. And here, this one is kind of old now, but uh, just showing that it's not just people who like rainwater harvesting. Here's rainwater for bears, and this happy-looking bear um, gets his, his or her water from rainwater that's been harvested and stored in underground cisterns. Your cistern can be visible. Now, this place here used to be a Heinz pickle factory, and those three tanks were pickling tanks. They uh, no longer make pickles there, and they donated or sold the building to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, who put rainwater harvesting on the roof, cleaned out these pickle tanks, and those are now used as cisterns for their rainwater harvesting system. And by the way, uh, this is off point, but I would just point out that their entrance is universally accessible to people of all abilities. So that is something that as designers we want to think about as well. Here is this uh, watershed building at uh, 4th Street in Eugene again. Now we're looking at their cisterns. There's one out front here. Uh, you see in two pictures, and then there's one in the courtyard. I took these pictures when it was still under construction, you can tell. And the architect was going for a Willamette Valley farmer sort of aesthetic, so that's why they're using this corrugated steel for the tank. This is an education center up near Seattle, and you can see on top of this cistern there's a roof washer, so the, the first flush gunk flows into the washer and settles in the bottom, and then the supply gets taken off the top, and then underneath is this big plastic tank. I just want to comment, I, I know we see a lot of these around, especially in houses, and they are easy to do. You just, you go to a supply shop, you buy one, you put it in, you're done. Uh, I just want to ask, can we do better? W these big black plastic things kind of say to people who don't know about rainwater, yeah, the uh, rainwater is ugly and we kind of don't care, um, but we're doing it anyway. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could make cisterns and other things of beauty to celebrate rainwater and to say, this is important to us, and we care about this. And don't you think this is a beautiful thing to be doing? So back to Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center again. Here is a map of the site, and each of those dark circles is a cistern. Over here on the right edge of the map, that is the entry cistern that is a sandstone tower that you've seen in earlier pictures, and this line with the arrows here is uh, that semicircular gutter that you saw. There's another sandstone cistern in the middle of the center right here that's even bigger, and I'll show you pictures of that. The top three pictures on this side, on this slide, are that sandstone cistern, and the cistern itself is in the core of the tower, and they've made it so that tourists, visitors, can walk up inside the tower 
look out the window and have a view, look through this uh, clear glass thing and see the rainwater and so forth. But this thing is uh, really a striking landmark, and you can see it from all over the Wildflower Center. Here in the lower right corner is that other sandstone cistern that you've seen in earlier slides. In the center bottom, you can see that uh, big sandstone cistern off in the distance. And then uh, these two lower pictures are examples of the architect exper well, not experimenting, uh, wanting to express different kinds of aesthetics. So this is a big, a big place. It's like a park and lots of visitors come here. And the architect wanted to show some of the things you can do with rainwater. So some of them are very artful and sculptural. Some of them, like this one in the lower middle, looks a lot like a grain silo you would find out in the Texas Hill Country. And then this one here, I don't know what the aesthetic is, but it's some kind of uh, stainless steel metal aesthetic. Once you have the water in your cistern, your tank, you need to distribute it. You need to get it to your faucet or your garden hose or wherever you're going. And there's only two ways to do that. One is by gravity. Uh, if your storage is higher than the outlet that you want to get the water out of, then you can use gravity. But if you can't do that, then your only other option is a pump. So this takes some planning. And uh, what we see in this diagram is a, a filter. The, this um, diagram is illustrating that in a big tank, the water uh, near the surface, just a few inches below the surface, is going to be the cleanest. Down in the bottom of the tank, you'll have um, debris that has precipitated out. And so you want to have a an intake with a filter near the surface of the water. Here's a commercial scale pump. Uh, what we're looking at in the right here is the pumping system for a rainwater harvesting system for a big urban plaza in Berlin, designed by my favorite water designer, Herbert Dreisaitl. You may have seen his name pop up uh, alongside a lot of the pictures I put in here. He's a, he's a creative genius when it comes to water. And he has done several of the parks in the Pearl District in Portland. Uh, I'm going to show you pictures of those when we talk about stormwater next. Finally, if for some reason you were able to use rainwater harvesting for potable uses, and I'm not sure where you could do that. Uh, but if you were, there are, of course, stringent laws. You cannot just take the water out of your cistern and start drinking it. So the laws say, among other things, first you have to have a filter. And the filter, the pore size, has to be um, able to filter out 5 micron diameter particles. And a micron is a millionth of a millimeter, so that is pretty darn small. Um, they recommend a carbon filter or, or equivalent. So that's filtration. You get the, the very finest particles out of there, but you still have to disinfect. You still have to kill organisms. And to do that, uh, you might want to consider ultraviolet light. That's a common method. Um, the other methods are chemical, and we don't prefer those. Whatever you do, you're going to have to get approval from the National Sanitation Foundation, which deals with health matters. And then, uh, like with any plumbing system, if there's potable use and non-potable use, you have to have a backflow prevention, one of those uh, uh, loops in the pipe, so that uh, contaminated water, uh, unfiltered, undisinfected water cannot get into the potable side of the house. And finally, just to be thorough, here is the list of sources one more time.